today we're going to talk about formal verification and cryptographic web applications and reading headlines off slides. Um, so, uh, what is that and who am I? Uh, I'm uh, Nadim. I uh, work in applied photography. I, uh, I'm finishing my PhD in um, applied photography at INRIA, which is the government uh, funded uh, public computer science lab uh, in France. Uh, and I'm attached to uh, Ecole Normale Supérieure in France. Um, and so the team where I work, on, uh, work at is called uh, Prosecco, which means programming securely with photography, which is what we do with the team. Um, and so at the team, we specialize in uh, cryptography and formal verification. And also, since I'm actually defending my thesis in like only two, three months, um, I also have my own consulting thing called Symbolic Software, where I do a lot of the work that I also present today. So what are my research goals uh, generally? My goals are to uh, essentially uh, identify the patterns in which cryptographic flaws occur in the world, um, see what are the common uh, failing points, and so on, and uh, to develop technologies to minimize these flaws occurring in the future based on what I have learned. Um, and so that's why formal verification is important. But you must be thinking that formal verification, wow, no, it sounds weird and foreign and hard. Isn't that a thing that only people in labs do? That certainly can have no impact on my uh, work as a web engineer interested in security? Well, aren't you going to be surprised when you watch this talk? <laughs> because uh, the point of this talk, as illustrated by the figure who is running, which is an activity that involves acti uh, motion in great speeds, uh, we will motivate you, or I will try to motivate you with examples on uh, to show you that formal verification is indeed something that you can bring to the web. So this is not a deep dive into theory. Um, I think that that would be a mistake. Um, and the goal is to just get you excited about this stuff. And uh, also, since I'm uh, preparing my thesis defense, this is like basically the uh, full version of my thesis defense, more or less, because it goes through my work over the past few years also, which centers exclusively around this topic. So. We're going to use cool motivating examples. We're going to talk about secure messaging, about TLS, about collaborative document editing that's end-to-end encrypted, about, uh, does anyone know noise, uh, the, the noise protocol framework? Has anyone heard of that? Uh, raise your hands if you've heard of that. Okay, maybe five people have heard of that. I know Jonas has heard of that. I don't know why he didn't raise his hand, Jonas. Um, so, um, uh, it's going to be motivated by all these cool examples. You be so amazed. So, um, Let's look at uh, the main technologies I'll be covering today. The first one is called Proverif. It doesn't mean like pro, like professional verif. It means protocol verif. It uh, wasn't developed by Microsoft, otherwise it'll be professional verif for work groups. Um, <laughs> automated enterprise edition. Automated uh, protocol verification. Uh, so that's when we actually take a crypto protocol. So what's a protocol like TLS or the signal protocol? and we produce uh, results on it through an automated program. There's a program, we describe the protocol, we describe TLS 1.2 or 1.3 to it, and it gives us answers to questions automatically. And so Proverif does that. Um, so the way that Proverif does that is that we describe the protocol, and then uh, it analyzes it on an active attacker sort of network simulation. And there's also Cryptoverif, which is developed by the same team, and uh, headed by the same person, Bruno Blanchet, uh, at, at Prosecco. And it's essentially very similar to Proverif. However, the method that it produces proofs is totally different. The way that it does that is by uh, producing actual game-based proofs, like the proofs that you, read in, that you read in papers, which is not like a simulation of our network. It's an actual like, proof in LaTeX, etc. Uh, and it does this automatically too. However, um, the way that you describe the protocol is quite different. In Cryptoverif, you describe it um, in a computational sense. And so what that means is that you actually say, you know, SHA-1 is a hash function, and it's vulnerable to, like, length extension attacks, right? However, when you want to describe a hash function in uh, Proverif, you can't describe the properties of the hash function. Hash function is just like a perfect black box. It means that you have an input, and you have an output, and it's a perfect hash function. It maps all outputs randomly, perfect, no, no collisions ever. It's the best hash function. And so you can't go into the details of what it means for it to be a hash function in a probabilistic Turing computer setting, right? You just describe it as like perfect, like what, what's an encryption function? It takes a ciphertext and a key and encrypts, produces a, uh, a plain text and a key, encrypts, produces a ciphertext. What's a decryption function? 
it takes the output of the encryption function and the same key and then gives you the result. So it's like this perfect sort of naive implementation of what primitives are without going into the functional details of the primitives themselves. And that's the difference between probability and cryptography. And I'm also going to talk about F star. And so F star is essentially, um, meanwhile in France, you have all the French academics who are going crazy over OCaml, but didn't you know that if you leave them alone for long enough, they'll actually produce something that's even more OCaml than OCaml, which is <laughs> F star. And so F star is when you take uh, OCaml and you go into a, an unholy Frankenstein-like setting and combine it with uh, an SMT solver, and lightning strikes in the background, da, da, it's alive! And out comes this weird thing that's a combination between an ML programming language and an SMT solver. And, like, if you thought COT was bad, oh my god. Um, which can be used to describe amazing uh, things uh, because it combines ML functional programming with actually an SMT solver, which means that when you type things at F star, types are proofs. So we're going to go into that and see what the implications are. And so with Proverif, we were able to do some, a lot of work regarding the signal, cool protocol that you all use for secure messaging, TLS, the cool protocol that you use for literally everything, uh, ACME, which is the underlying protocol for Let's Encrypt, which I'm sure a lot of you use, and a bunch of other stuff too, including Capsule, an end-to-end -end encrypted uh, document collaborat collaboration protocol standard that I just came up with and will present. It's currently uh, uh, being reviewed at a conference, and also some other stuff. Uh, we also did use CryptoVerif for TLS and Signal and WireGuard. Currently using it for WireGuard. That's actually, the WireGuard part is not my work, it's someone else in the team, Benjamin Lip. And um, for F star, um, uh, people at Inria, not me, have used it to implement Hackle Star, which is this really amazing cryptographic library that is implemented in F star. However, we can compile it to C while still maintaining memory safety, functional correctness, and side channel resistance. And it's still the fastest library. <laughs> and so. <laughs> Um, there's also Microsoft Research are going nuts and they're implementing the entire HTTPS stack in F star. I have no comment on that. <laughs> so, um, uh, cryptographic web applications, they're really great and important. There was this amazing, incredible web application called CryptoCat in 2011. It's the best application ever written. And the per person who wrote it is very smart and cool. And um, actually, it was, uh, so this was an application that I wrote in 2011. And it was uh, full of bugs, and, uh, uh, but uh, in my defense, it was the first ever uh, opportunity to bring uh, sort of end-to-end -end encryption to the web uh, and do stuff in JavaScript. So at the time, this was a very dangerous idea, but it's, we're going to use it as a motivating example. What can formal verification bring to something super buggy like CryptoCat? But also, like, aside from that, forget CryptoCat. Like, look at what's happening with WhatsApp. You know, WhatsApp Web now implements this whole... Uh, native encryption protocol to do uh, like this end-to-end -end encrypted view into your phone and Signal Desktop obviously implements the entire single sc stack. Skype, did you know that even Skype for desktop, like Skype for Windows and Mac on your desktop, is now actually an Electron app using full JavaScript. Um, and so this is a very recent development. And so all of this stuff is stuff that we want to look into. And so let's take a look at how CryptoCat benefited from, C from formal verification. It was a buggy mess, so what do I mean by buggy mess? So, for example, we uh, generated curve to 5509, like the you know, public keys. The private key was supposed to be, uh, how large is it in uh, curve to 5509? It's 128 bits or 56 bits, I frankly forgot. But anyway, we were generating it uh, a 56 bit uh, private key. So, by mistake, no, this was not intentional because we were unable to correctly type. Uh, values uh, and big integers in uh, JavaScript. So that's a big mistake. Another cryptographic mistake, uh, nonce reuse. Who here has heard of nonce reuse? That's great, awesome. Sorry, I actually don't really know the exact demographic of the audience. So if I'm uh, being too complicated or dumbing things down too much or um, addressing uh, in a different context, I just, I've never been to Sweden, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I'll try my best. Um, so, um, all right, um, there was also like a nonce reuse attack where you are using, uh, so certain kinds of like ciphers like AES and counter mode, if you use the same IV or nonce twice, a huge problem, everything breaks. And so these are all protocol uh, issues and implementation issues that we can detect. And so what did we do? Uh, we decided, okay, we're going to re-implement CryptoCat from scratch. So we took the signal protocol, which is this thing, 
And we uh, decided to model it in Proverb, where we describe the processes. And we say, okay, you have Alice, and she's doing HKDF, she's doing HMAX, she's doing uh, generating signature keys, and she's signing um, her uh, one-time pre-key, and she's uploading the signed pre-key, uh, and the one-time pre-key, which is unsigned, excuse me. And Bob is doing the same thing. Whoa, all these things are happening. So many, so much later. Oh my God. Uh, and um, uh, you're doing all these things, and then you know you're illustrating the top level process of what Alice is doing, what Bob is doing, and then what Proverif is going to do informally is essentially um, uh, a simple way to explain this. You know, so I told Proverif what the protocol uh, functions of Signal are, and I illustrated to Proverif, you know, this is what a Signal authenticated key exchange. This is like what a session establishment looks like. Okay, we can do the same thing with TLS, and this is like the first message that Alice is going to send to Bob, and Bob is going to respond with this message. And then we're going to ask Proverif, okay, given this scenario, and given that you, Proverif, have an active attacker on this network that can send an unbounded number of messages in this scenario, right, over like parallel processes and any permutation of messages, essentially. Um, this is an informal description. The exact description is probably more nuanced. Um, can you, Proverif, tell me if the plain text of the message, of the first message sent between Alice and Bob, will stay uh, confidential? Can you, Proverif, tell me, please, if the second message, the response from Bob to Alice, will also be confidential? Can Proverif tell me uh, that if Alice sends a message to Bob, sorry, if Bob receives a message from Alice, Bob will only authenticate that message from Alice, if and only if Alice had indeed sent that message to Bob. Uh, that's authenticity. So the first property is confidentiality, that's authenticity. And also, we can even compromise Alice's state, local state, and say, okay, like, which messages remain safe when Alice's state is compromised? And that's post-compromised security, also known as future secrecy, and forward secrecy, right? So we can model all of those things in Proverf. We can ask Proverf these specific questions that in Proverf we call queries and events. So, great. Uh, we did that. And uh, why did we choose Signal Protocol, first of all, before getting to the results? So it's the most widely used secure messaging protocol. Does any, please raise your hand if you use Signal or WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger or Allo or CryptoCat or Wire or Signal or, man, Moxie's been busy. So, yeah, all of you guys. Um, uh, it's, it's not only widely used, which means it's impactful and there was like a benefit to producing scientific uh, information on this, but also it's an ambitious protocol. Like we didn't want to target like this silly, simple protocol and say, okay, well, our, our framework works for naive Diffie Hellman. We wanted to say, you know, this works for a big protocol that does like forward secrecy, future secrecy, all of these ambitious properties. So it also does, uh, so the way it, does, the way it works essentially, this is, a, this is the same as the slide before. <coughs> this is the same thing, but it's much simpler. So it does a four-way Diffie-Hellman, you know, the sign free keys, one-time free key stuff, so that it can do it asynchronously. Like, yeah, I can initiate a session with my friend without my friend being online because they upload public keys beforehand and they sign one of them. Um, and uh, they have this complex key schedule for doing something called ratcheting between messages where between every message sent and received in Signal, there's like a key refresh update, and that makes it so that if your phone is stolen halfway through the conversation, the person who steals your phone, maybe they can decrypt one message, maybe they can decrypt maybe five messages, but not the whole discussion, based on the key recovery. They can impersonate you, though, uh, indefinitely, until you like revoke the key or do what it depends on the implementation. So um, let's see what we discovered when we modeled this into the um, we uh, discovered that, so uh, there's something called an uh, unknown key share attack. So for example, what I said before is that if someone steals my phone, they can impersonate me, right? Because my identity keys are on the phone. Makes sense? However, we discovered that if someone steals my phone, they can impersonate you to me also. So this is a new thing that no one knew. It's not a big deal, but you know, I think the signal people thought we were saying we broke signal, which is not what we said. but. It's just a small little thing that you can fix. We also discovered that Signal wasn't particularly resistant to replay attacks, and this was also fixed in a later version. A replay attack is when you, um, uh, so the, I send the message, I say, let's get ice cream, and then uh, the, certain, like, the attacker records the message and then sends it again later. So let's get ice cream is like a naive example, but for example, let's say I send the message yes, which is a very important message. The attacker knows that I just said yes. So later on, uh, you want to go to get ice cream? Yes. Do you want to bomb the parliament? Yes. So this can implicate me in a, in a weird situation. Um, 
All right, so we discovered uh, these, uh, you know, modest attacks. We modeled them, so we discovered them through Proverif, and Proverif is able to tell us, hey, look, if you do this, because it organizes all possible scenarios, and it's able to tell us, oh, hey, if this scenario happens, then aha, you can do a replay attack, right? So what we did, um, oops, okay, so what we did was develop this cool framework. So this is how the new CryptoCat uh, secure messaging application, which you can download and use it. Uh, frankly, in terms of features and usability, uh, it's not like, it, it's pretty good, but it's limited to desktop. Uh, so you can try it out. It's, it's a reasonable, stable application, but it's not a full replacement for something like Signal these days. Um, <coughs> but anyway, so you have like, so the way that it works right now is that similar to Signal Desktop and Skype and WhatsApp web, it has like this JavaScript web app component. Can you actually see my laser? I don't think so. No, okay. Can you see my, no you can't, well, what would it the, the thing at the top where it says JavaScript web app. Uh, so this is like the big thing, and then inside it you have another part that says protocol code, and this is like the signal protocol implementation in JavaScript. And then you have the crypto library, which is like this trusted crypto library. However, the way that we did this is very interesting. So the part that says protocol code, which is the implementation of signal in JavaScript, is not actually just JavaScript. Uh, it's, well, it is just JavaScript, but it's actually a subset of JavaScript. So did you, you, you're familiar maybe with the fact that JavaScript has a subset which is a purely functional programming language, right? Great. So we took that subset, which is a purely functional programming language, and it turns out that the language in which you describe um, uh, Proverif models, called the Applied High Calculus, is very similar to ML, because everything made in France is similar to ML. Um, and so ML, of course, is super functional. So we developed a subset of JavaScript called ProScript. Um, and uh, it's essentially this purely functional subset that uh, doesn't allow like, things like accessing objects, object properties. Even like it doesn't allow you to extend an array. Uh, you have to declare all uh, variables at the very top of each function. It's this very pure, hardcore, functional subset of JavaScript that's still easy to program in, you know, if you, if you have a discipline. And um, essentially, uh, we call it ProScript, and we developed the ProScript compiler. So the, what the ProScript compiler can do <coughs> is take ProScript implementation of Signal, or TLS, we implemented both in ProScript, and generate the Proverif model immediately. And then from there, you can verify it in Proverif. And we did that for uh, TechSecure, for Signal, sorry, and for... Um, um, TLS. And so for the signal implementation, that's the implementation that's in CryptoCat today. So if you use CryptoCat today, you're going to have this signal implementation, which is this formally verified implementation. And what I, what I mean by that is, look, so here on the left you have ProScript describing uh, a part of signal, including the send keys and uh, K keys, like key derivation functions. Oh, this no, sorry, this is actually the function that derives the send keys, which is, if you read the signal spec, like this is part of the signal spec. And here you have the equivalent in uh, Proverif. On the, so this is what Proverif applied by calculus language looks like. As you can see, it's super similar. And the code on the right is generated by the compiler. Even though it's generated by the compiler, it's still nice, readable, you know, you can, it's less, of course, much less readable than the one on the left. But you can still go through the <coughs> formal model and you can say, oh, now I can reason about my protocol immediately in the formal model. And that's a useful conclusion to have, right? So that's nice. Um, and we were able to translate into, uh, into Proverb. And so when you use uh, ProScript to translate into Proverb, it also does some really cute things also. So for example, if you have Diffie-Hellman, it will detect that you're doing a Diffie-Hellman and uh, illustrate the Diffie-Hellman relationship in Proverb also. So in Proverb, it's important for you to say, for example, that when I'm doing Diffie-Hellman, g to the a to the b is equal to g to the b to the a. Because if you don't say that in Proverb, then it doesn't know that this is the helmet, just because this, it's symbolic, remember? It's not algebraic. So it doesn't understand algebraic relationships unless you illustrate them symbolically. Um, so, great. We uh, then define, so one important thing. We're able to translate the protocol code into Proverb, right? However, uh, we're not able to uh, automatically obtain in Proverb the actual execution of the protocol, right? Because you're translating a library. Signal library. The signal library doesn't contain like, okay, Bob is now going to send a message and Alice is going to respond with two messages and then Bob is going to send a fourth message. Of course not. So we need to write that by hand. And you have to go and you have to write, okay, Alice sends first message, Bob receives first. You can, for example, write a model that says, Alice sends 50 messages, Bob responds. 
Alice sends one message, Bob responds immediately, then Alice responds immediately. And these are very important, for actually, to do, the, to do these different uh, permutations to test for um, uh, different windows of compromise. Because the kind of key refresh that you get in Signal when you send a message and then receive a message is much different than when you send 50 messages. When you send 50 messages, you're just hashing one key forward. When you receive a message, you're receiving fresh key material. And that's a completely different story when you want to analyze it that way. Great. So we define the queries. The queries, you know, queries are questions. You know, is this message safe? Is the message received by Bob sent indeed by Alice? And we execute it over a network with an active attacker. So as I mentioned, we found a key compromise impersonation. And for example, you can even, uh, at some point in the protocol, I forgot uh, an HMAC. I had to do an HMAC check, and I forgot it, and Proverif caught it. Because when it compiled from Proscript to Proverif, it figured that there's not an HMAC check here, and since I'm not checking for HMACs on receiving messages, they're not authenticated, and I was able to find a bug then. So in Proverif, we're able to verify for confidentiality, authenticity, forward secrecy, future secrecy, indistinguishability. So indistinguishability means that, you know, I send two messages on the network, the attacker cannot tell which message is which. which one. <coughs> one message is yes, one message is no, the attacker cannot differentiate. And absence of replay attempts. So uh, when illustrating these scenarios, it's important to note that, for example, if we illustrated a scenario in Proverif where you had Alice, Bob, and Mallory participating in a conversation, and Mallory was discussing with separate conversations with Alice and Bob, and her keys were compromised, and each person sent three messages, so that's like a very complicated scenario, that would take 11 hours to verify. However, if you had a scenario where Alice and Bob sent two messages to each other, very normal, and you're just testing for forward secrecy, not confidential, not, uh, sorry, you're just testing for confidentiality, not forward secrecy, which means that you're not leaking the keys, uh, the state, then that can be verified maybe in two minutes. So verification time can get larger, and you can never verify a really big scenario with like 10 messages, because it would be way too slow. So that's a limitation that I have to tell you about. Um, we also uh, wrote a crypto model. So back when we did this uh, a year, two years ago, the syntax of crypto was also the applied type calculus, but it was very different, because crypto was still very experimental. Very recently, crypto now has a new syntax, which is very similar to Proverb. And so this is something that's super, super recent, like last month. And we're still, uh, so now, we're still sort of adapting to see how we can automatically generate crypto models because the syntax is so similar now. However, back in the time, we did not uh, automatically generate the crypto models. They were all written by hand. But the benefit was that we were able to uh, obtain actual proofs. So Proverif doesn't give you proofs. It gives you verification results. Because it doesn't give you like QED, this is safe because you know the HMAC assumption and then the gap if you have an assumption and these, these assumptions hold, then according to this game, the, there's no distinguisher, waha, I have a proof. Uh, this is what CryptoVerif does. <coughs> Proverif says, I tried every single possible thing over the network. And I could not get a result that contradicted this query that this specific question that you asked me. Um, an popular opinion in my own team, but I actually very much prefer Proverif. Because in my time there, I found that uh, it gives me a uh, much better return on investment. I have to spend less time with it, and the results it gives me, I feel, are more relevant to me as a, as a person focused on applied systems. So, of course, different people have different priorities, but I, I feel like I really appreciate Proverif, and I wish my team paid more attention to it. Um, but CryptoVerif is now like the future, and also uh, FSTAR, we'll get to FSTAR. So don't forget, we not only did Signal, but we also used this exact same approach with like uh, Proscript, Proverif, and CryptoVerif <coughs> to do TLS 1.3, and we did it while TLS 1.3 was being uh, prototyped. And this was published at uh, Oakland SMP last year, and we won the Best Paper Award there, which is insane. Uh, and um, uh, also the, the Signal paper was published at Euro SMP um, also last year. So uh, there was the... Um, uh, with the TLS stuff, there was a Proscript implementation of TLS 1.3 called DraftTLS, which was integrated as a testbed, not in production, into the Brave web browser, which is being developed by Brendan Eich's team, the creator of JavaScript. And uh, also, um, uh, we did a proof model, we did a crypto model, it's very similar, but I just wanted to show you that this is. So this is the crypto syntax. I think this is the new syntax. Great. So another thing that we did with uh, Proverif was, uh, so you guys heard of Let's Encrypt? You've probably used it a lot. It's very popular. Great. The protocol that underlies Let's Encrypt 
the protocol that you use to issue certificates is called Acme. And so uh, when Acme version 1 was issued, uh, the Acme team sent an email to my thesis advisor telling him, hey, why don't you take a look at this? Because um, he's uh, Kartika Mragavan, uh, he's uh, broken a ton of protocols. And uh, he took a look and we ended up making this proof of reef model. And uh, we also found a ton of attacks, uh, in, well, two attacks in Acme v1. And uh, we were able to issue fixes and patch them Acme v2, and this was published in financial crypto. But just, just to give you an extra motivating example. So that was last year. This year, what's going on with these technologies before I move into something else? So now the project that I'm working on today, uh, which is still a work in progress, and this is like my next project, is called Noise Shaper. And so have you heard of the, uh, I asked this before, how many people said they had heard of the noise verification framework, maybe five or six? All right, so no, the creator, one of the creators of Signal, uh, Trevor Perrin, who is an amazing protocol designer, and of personal inspiration, has uh, created uh, this uh, uh, framework for uh, designing and uh, essentially implementing protocols, but more like, so it's, it's kind of, have you ever seen a pachinko machine? So uh, it's like a pachinko machine, and each of the balls, instead of being random, you sort of like prime the machine with a bunch of balls that are weighted different weights, and depending on the weight, the machine will operate differently and put the balls in differently, and at the end you get this protocol execution. It's, it, does that make sense? No. Okay. Um, essentially, it's, it's this computer. It's like, I would call it the noise protocol computer rather than the noise protocol framework. Uh, it's essentially this uh, computer, you input a bunch of tokens, and it gives you like this protocol. And the, to depending, the tokens are very simple. This is actually a noise handshake. This, whole, this tiny little thing here in the circle. This is a noise handshake. Just, you know, arrow, right arrow, S, dot, dot, dot. Um, right arrow, um, left arrow, S, dot, dot, dot. Right arrow, E, E, S, S. So each one of these, so S means static key, E means uh, ephemeral key, E, S means uh, Diffie-Hellman between the static and the ephemeral key. Uh, between the sender and the recipient, the initiator and the responder. And so each one of these tokens, depending on its order, is going to issue actually some very specific local state updates and responses that are very well defined and like the state machine is going to evolve in this very specific way. And based on just this, the order of these tokens, the noise protocol framework for local computer for both parties will evolve in this interesting way. And you can use this very condensed and very simple like organization of tokens to illustrate any kind, like so many diverse types of key exchanges and protocol, key establishments and all kinds of protocols. From the, so the WireGuard, uh, you heard of WireGuard by Jason Donenfeld? It's this excellent new uh, VPN system that's based on noise. It uses uh, the IKE IK or IPSK, I forgot what it's called. It uses one of the, I think it's this one actually. It uses one of the noise uh, uh, handshake patterns and uh, what we're doing, so what I'm doing, is I'm going to, so because the, the, noise, the, the noise language for describing handshake patterns and noise is tiny. Um, and you can use it to describe everything from the WireGuard VPN to maybe something similar to TLS to Signal for sure. And what I'm going to do is have this compiler that takes any noise handshake and transforms it into a full proverbial model. And then you can obtain verification results. But what's really interesting about Noise Shaper is that unlike the previous project that I discussed, the top level process, which is like, you know, what is Alice doing, what's Bob doing, is generated automatically. And this is not something that we can do previously. And so you don't have to do anything. And then, intelligently, Noise Shaper can also infer what the queries are. It can detect that, oh, this is likely a protocol, based on the way that the protocol is constructed, it can reliably say like, oh, there's a bunch of ephemeral keys here. This is likely a protocol designed for forward secrecy. I must have a query in my proof model for forward secrecy. It will insert that query automatically and test for it. Same confidentiality, et cetera, et cetera. And then, so, as you see, the language is pretty small, right? So maybe there's like two to the 64 potential, maybe less, two to the 16, I don't know. I haven't checked, but like there's a small subset, well, relatively small subset of uh, protocols that you can describe. So why not have like this really powerful server verify every single possible noise protocol and cache all of the verification results and then you have this encyclopedia of being like, okay, I have this noise protocol, tell me what you know about it. Boom, all the scenarios it's resistant to. 
full verification results against all kinds of queries. And even if it doesn't cache it, you just wait like a couple of minutes or hours, depends, and then you just get a result and it's cached forever. Right? So that's great. Um, and that's what I'm working on. You can see you can sort of apply these technologies to have a very broad sort of approach to web security. You know? So web security, uh, formal verification. Okay, so that's all, man. Uh, we have like more stuff going on in the future. It's all actually in the wow. Okay, it's all actually in the past. Um, so let's take a look at what we did with CryptoCat, just to see what the past was about. Um, we did uh, the, the PostScript protocol core for Signal. We translated and verified it in Proverif. We manually proved it in CryptoVerif, and then we did the trusted cryptographic core. Great. Uh, what can we do in the future? So in the future. We know that the structure is there. You know, we know that we have this protocol we want to verify, we have this untrusted web application, we have the trusted crypto primitives, and so on. How can we improve these components now that the structure that we're targeting we know exists, and we know what the pitfalls are? So we're working on a ton of next-gen tech in the Prosecco research team, uh, and this is stuff I'm working on, but also a lot of other people in my team are working on, and sometimes it's stuff that only they are working on and haven't touched, so I'll be very careful to explain which is which. I don't want to like, steal credit. Um, so, um, we're working on a ton of stuff, uh, F-star, the cool language I mentioned before, Hacklestar, something interesting. So let's ease into these uh, new technologies by mentioning this cool uh, new standard that combines the technologies I just explained with the ones I want to explain going forward. So this is Capsule. Um, have you ever been in a situation where you're writing a very sensitive work document and you're collaborating on it with your team but you're all using Google Docs because there's nothing better to do to use to collaborate on the document together even though it's very sensitive. Has that happened to you? <laughs> Great. This is like the part of the commercial where like the camera is black and white and the guy's looking at the camera like it's not working for me and then like and then like shiny colors are bright and there's someone with a smile coming in who's very confident and successful in life. I have the solution. So it's this uh, new protocol for, um, I don't know if infomercials are the same in Sweden. <laughs> hoping, hoping beyond hope. So um, uh, it's essentially a protocol to make that workflow secure. It's an end-to-end -end encryption uh, collaborative, uh, for collaborative document editing. And so uh, diffs, you're all familiar with diffs. So we organize diffs in a hash chain. And so you have a hash chain of encrypted diffs. And uh, the access to a document is just a simple ID and users prove issue a proof, actual proof, of knowledge of the ID to participate in the document. It has these very simple primitives. Blake 2 is used for literally everything except for signing, because it would be too slow for signing, even though it would be quantum safe. Um, uh, and we use ED25519 for signing, because it's faster, but not quantum safe. Well, who cares about There's an upcoming talk. We can talk more about quantum stuff. So, um, all right. So what, does, what are the goals? Um, Participant list integrity, the server cannot add participants that aren't there. Uh, confidentiality, no one knows what's in the document except the people authoring it. Integrity, mm, I can't fake uh, edits, no one can fake edits. Uh, authentication, I know who's in the document and I know who wrote what. Transcript consistency, uh, this is the real document and no other version of the document exists and the server cannot serve me fake documents or partial documents or alternate histories of documents. And this is, uh, the last one is the fact that it's a hash chain of the diffs, so blockchain automatically guarantees that. So we're not gonna go into how the protocol works because no one cares about that, this is not a crypto talk, but I just wanna show like, this is a new web technology, right? It uses end-to-end -end encryption, we want to replace Google Docs with it. So what do we do? For, on the protocol level, we also like formally verified it with Proverif and there's also a hand proof, but no one cares about the hand proof. So, however, on the implementation level, instead of having like this just trusted cryptographic library, we also have a new thing called Hackle Wasm, which is the first software to use Hackle Star in WebAssembly. So what's Hackle Star? I mentioned Hackle Star earlier. It's this cryptographic library that uh, is written in F Star, which is the language that combines ML with an SFT solver and uh, types are proofs. And you can, so what does types are proofs mean? It means that in F Star, if you, you could, for example, have a type which is point on curve. And any value will only type check if it's indeed a point on this elliptic curve. You can have a type like output of SHA2 function, and this will only type check if it's a correct output of the SHA2 like uh, uh, ARX, I think, is, is SHA2 ARX? I forget, like the SHA2 permutation boxes and whatever. 
Um, and uh, like only, it will only type check if it's a correct output of that. So all of these like advanced type checking, uh, I, I wish uh, one of my colleagues, so I, I'm not actually particularly into F star. Um, I think uh, Benjamin or Denis would probably make a better job. Anyway, so um, in this language, uh, a former student at Nuria who recently finished his PhD implemented or headed the implementation effort for something called Hacklestar. You implement Curve to 5519, if you have an RS, I think RSA, no, I think we didn't implement RSA. Uh, Poly1305, SHA2, uh, AES, GCM, all of the cryptographic primitives, you implement them in F star, and then using something called the Kremlin compiler, well, I'll get to that, but, you know, this is cool, interesting, you can get a verified implementation very fast, we'll get to that in a bit. It's in capsule. In WebAssembly, even though it's F star. How do you get from F star to WebAssembly? Isn't WebAssembly different? And for the web? We'll get to that in a bit. But, however, before we get to that, um, I just want to show you that this is what the proof trace looks like for Capsule. This is what one of the outputs of proof looks like. As you can see, there are many letters and lines. It's very <laughs> impressive and therefore very legitimate. Moving on. Um, uh, so you can just learn more about Capsule. You can download the proof model at this link, symbolic software slash Capsule. But there's also the preprint paper, which is like this preprint pre for the paper, which is going to be a proceedings paper if I get accepted. Um, you can check it out here, this link. Um, and you can read more about that protocol. But, so let's see how this protocol implements Hackle star. But first we have to discuss, what is F-star? So F-star is a general purpose functional programming language aimed at formal verification. It combines uh, SMT-based uh, verification with Z3 with an ML syntax to build amazing things. As I mentioned before, Project Everest, the full verified HTTPS stack slash crazy project by Microsoft Research and Inria. Um, uh, Hacklestar, the fastest cryptographic library for most primitives with side channel resistance, functional correctness, and memory safety, despite it being the fastest one, and much more. Using the Kremlin compiler, so Kremlin is part of the F-star toolkit, and what it does is that it compiles, uh, so F-star by default compiles to OCaml. I don't, I don't think it needs Kremlin to do that, just compiles to OCaml, after type checking and everything, using Z3. However, if you compile, if you write your code in a subset of F-star called Lowstar, you can also use the Kremlin compiler to compile from low star to C. And the C code that you get as a result will maintain memory safety, functional correctness, and all of that stuff, um, and also pass comp cert tests in, F -star, in C. So, disclaimer, I have nothing to do with this work. This is um, work in my lab. This is uh, Benjamin Berdouche, uh, Jean-Karim zanzan uh Kartik Bhagavan, uh, Katalin Hitku, Jonathan Podzenko from Microsoft Research, not me. Um, however, I'm also helping with one cool part, which is that we're going to uh, have Kremlin produce uh, Hackle Star in WebAssembly. And not just Hackle Star, but any F Star program, we're going to be able to compile it to WebAssembly. We already have this working, but uh, it's still a work in progress in the sense that we're not particularly sure we can cover all the bases. We don't know how resistant, uh, like how truly we have uh, functional correctness and memory safety. This is still a work in progress. Um, okay, so that's a cool Hackle Star thing. Let's, what else can we do with F Star? So I have, so you can see this is my project, because it has a ridiculous name. This is the uh, Quacky Ducky F Star Parser Generator. The reason why it's called Quacky Ducky was because uh, it was done at Microsoft Research, and I really loved the idea of making everyone at Microsoft Research say the phrase Quacky Ducky multiple times a day, and it worked. And to this day, in Cambridge, people at Microsoft Research Quacky ducky all the time, <laughs> in a very serious tone. Like, have you worked on, what are the latest quacky ducky results? <laughs> this is the, the, the biggest accomplishment of my life. I am pretty, pretty sure about that. No regrets. Um, and so, uh, what does quacky ducky do? Um, have you ever seen an, uh, a TLS classification? Have you ever looked at the TLS spec? Cool. So the TLS, you're familiar with this? Like the enums and the structs in the TLS spec? So in, in TLS spec and, and plenty of other specs in the world, in RFCs, you have this weird, uh, weird sort of informal language that we call the RFC language. At least I called it that. Um, and it's used to specify enums and structs for data structures. And so what Quacky Ducky does is that it takes this uh, uh, sort of template uh, of the, uh, we call it the TLS message template here, I guess, and then produces, automatically generates enough star, a very formally verified, secure, functionally correct, Parser and serializer for all data structures in TLS based on, so you literally feed it an English language RFC and you immediately get like this full parser and you can use that to solve a bunch of problems. 
so like all of the parsing errors, all of like this entire class of bugs is eliminated because you get these formally verified automatically like outputted parsers and serializers in F-star, and then this goes straight into Project Everest, which is the big project to build the HTTP stack. This was joint work with me and uh, Antoine Deligna Lavo at Microsoft Research and Cedric Fournet, and now with uh, Tahina, who is uh, uh, currently working a lot on this project. Um, okay, I think I covered this slide, great. So, um, let's look at uh, uh, what, what, uh, what, what the F-Star pipeline looks like. So we have Hackle, a cryptographic library written in F-Star. We have Lowstar, the subset of F-Star that we can compile to C. We have Kremlin, a Lowstar compiler to C. Uh, and then we have Kremlin now also working on, well, almost, it's almost a WASM compiler, it kind of works. And we're going to have Hackle WASM soon, we have native, so for example, something that you can never do in JavaScript is native 64-bit operations, right? But you can do that in WebAssembly. So this is like a new thing, we can do that safely because we know we're generating from a star. We can also maintain constant time and functional correctness parameters. So that's where we're going with that, and I think that means a lot of really good security benefits for the web by implementing formal verification. So, um, Hackle Wasm hopefully will give us uh, perhaps the most high assurance cryptographic primitives uh, for the web. Uh, and, uh, you know, we don't want to implement this just for capsule, but also we know, for example, that WebAssembly can go in a lot of places on mobile applications, but also the new Signal for desktop, the new Skype for desktop, which are Electron apps, like all of these places we can start inserting. Every, like, so many things support C already. We already have Hackle Star and C, it works great. And then so many things in the future are going to support uh, WebAssembly. Uh, sorry, so many things already support WebAssembly, and in the future we can support that and we can target so many things with this formally verified code. Um, so this is related work. This is also something that I did not work on at all. Um, but uh, I just wanted to show you because it's cool. So uh, as I mentioned, the Hackle Star library was written by Jean-Karim Zanzander Hue. However, uh, last summer, uh, another PhD student in Riyadh, Benjamin Bardouche, uh, implemented uh, that Hackle Star library uh, while doing an internship at Mozilla in Firefox. And so if you use Firefox today, like Firefox Quantum, the new version which was issued like six months ago, you are using Hackle Star because it's in all of Firefox stable today. And they started, uh, Benjamin started with implementing uh, Curve to 5519, but they've expanded it along with, so I think he worked with uh, Eric Criscorla, Tim Tober, and uh, Franciscus, uh, sorry, Franciscus, I forgot his last name. Um, and uh, they um, also implemented SHA-20, Poly 135, and SHA-2, I think, um, in Firefox, and now you have all these verified primitives in Firefox 57, and there are like millions and millions of computers, including my computer. Um, and so that's a great sort of way to see the impact on the web. And uh, finally, I think this is the last motivating project I'm going to discuss today, leaving a healthy 15 minutes for questions. Uh, this is uh, my project, I'm working on this, uh, Ledger Design Language. So as you all know, the public ledger and blockchain space, uh, as you can see, uh, designs are extremely legitimate and the space right now is very credible. So there's actually no need for any of this, and I strongly suggest that you all sell your houses and invest in ICOs. <laughs> Thanks for having me. And Kidding. Okay, so um, <laughs> nobody designing public ledgers has any idea what they're doing. And uh, so this is why there's Ledger Design Language. It's a dom domain specific modeling language for describing public ledgers. That's the name Ledger Design Language. Hopefully it's it's out. And uh, we have the LDL compiler, which takes this domain specific language. And what it does is produce two outputs. The compiler has two outputs. The first output is a Proverif model where you can verify your ledger design as a protocol being executed over a network. And the second output is an F star API, where you can immediately get an implementation of your uh, client server um, prototype of your public ledger, and you can immediately start testing it. So on the Proverif model, you can query for block integrity, block authenticity, and block privacy on the F and other properties. On the F star API side, you immediately get uh, an API for testing out your thing in the wild with a server and a client for your public ledger to do write operations, etc., with functional correctness, verified primitives uh, with Hector star and runtime safety. So that's the goal of Ledger Design Language. So for example, here uh, on the top left, you can see what LDL actually looks like. You have block types, like the root block, which has a date, an answer, and a string, uh, and comes before user chain blocks and has multiple branches. 
So by defining block types and properties, and they're using actor declarations, which I don't think are shown here, we can essentially uh, define what the tree, what the Merkle tree looks like, what types of blocks are there, and then what actors, what the heck actors are doing. And then the result is this simple language, as you can see on the top left, and on the bottom right is actually the syntax rules of the language, and this is the full language as it is right now. Probably will evolve and become better with time, but this is like a simple, concrete language. Um, and so the simple language lets you reason about your ledger design as well as prototype it in the real world without risk or with much less risk. So this is a cool upcoming publication at the end of this month at the IEEE or SMP. And here at the right you have a starker. You can see that uh, this is similar to my slide on program if, uh, on Proscript 2 program. Great. So, conclusion. So many ways to bring formal verification to the web. You have formally verified secure messaging and TLS 1.3. You know what I'm going to do? Hold on. I feel like this is such a sales pitch that I have to play the music from the Wii eShop. You guys know the Wii eShop? It has this amazing music that's like very awesome for a sales pitch. One second. It's worth it. The photo was worth it. Remember? So this is going to be worth it. I have an amazing sense of humor. There we go. Okay, so to conclude, we have the formally verified secure messaging and TLS 1.3 prototyping in Let's Encrypt's improvements using ProVerif, CryptoVerif, and Proscrap, <laughs> bringing automated protocol verifications to web applications. And don't forget, automated mechanized specification and attacker slash query generation for an entire protocol framework when we apply Noise Shaper, which turns any noise handshake pattern into smart answers to good questions. And finally, not even finally, secure collaborative document editing with formally verified protocol and components using ProVerif for protocol modeling and hacking wasm for the most secure way to implement cryptographic primitives to get the best, cleanest shape. And then, formally verified parser generation directly from spec using the Quacky Ducky to generate that quacky ducky to generate parsers in the star directly from TLS 1.2 and 1.3 specs. And secure cryptographic primitives across various platforms by designing Hackle Star and F Star and compiling to target C and Wasm while preserving speed and advanced security guarantees. And last but not least, designing new domain specific languages to bring much needed rigor to Wild West exciting areas with ledger design language for modeling public ledger designs into ProVerif models and F-Star client-server APIs. So many ways to bring formal verification to the web with this talk where I discuss these ways. All right. So, thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, happy to take your questions if you have questions. Yeah. Um, I guess that you will probably get this question and ask it another second. Oh, maybe I should hand you a microphone, sorry. Um, Here, this yeah. one's on. I guess that you get this question and ask it on every single time that you have given this talk, but uh, I have how do you formally verify the compilers that you are making to ensure that the code that they generate is correct? That's an excellent question, and I do get that question when the papers are being reviewed. This is the first time I get this talk. Um, so, sorry. Um, for, so let's talk about the specific compilers. For the Proscript to Proverif compiler, there is zero verification. And if you have a bug, you have a bug. And it's pretty buggy, actually. It's very researchy software, but you can eventually have... So we have translation rules. What we can do is we can prove the translation rules to be secure, and then when we do the compiler, we can use some uh, uh, compiler certifying process. But this is all work that I have to do later. Uh, maybe after I graduate and I like, sort of make these into usable tools. Um, this is definitely something that I should clarify. So the Proscript compiler has no guarantee of compiler correctness. Neither does the noise, the noise shaper compiler is close to it, actually. I might have that for the noise shaper compiler. Um, Kremlin, I think. <laughs> 
Honestly, I'm not sure. I think Kremlin might have some level of uh, correctness, but I'm not, a, I'm not qualified. I've, I haven't worked on Kremlin other than helping a little bit with the WebAssembly part, but I'm not qualified to answer that. In general, uh, the compilers are not proven correct at all. Uh, uh, more often than Any other questions? I have more, but uh, if you somebody else asks. Well, I think you can ask another one. Right. Okay, so the second question I have, you were talking about how uh, proving, uh, making proofs on crypto brief mm -hmm. uh, can vary from 2 minutes to up uh, to 11 hours, for example, in some cases. Uh, crypto brief is a bit faster, Sorry. but manually assisted. Uh, what, uh, what is the limiting factor, I think? What makes it go from 2 minutes to up to 11 hours? Is it the size of the proof? or? It's, so when you're doing something in Proverif, essentially, if you have a, if you're sending two messages over the network, the possible combination of what's going over the network is, you know, two to the whatever. It's limited to this particular uh, state size. However, the state size in Proverif is growing exponentially. If you go from two messages to three messages, that's a huge increase in the so in, in, an increase in what? An increase in the ways in which the messages can be exchanged over the network, the order in which they can be exchanged, the kind of inputs and outputs that can be fed to every channel. And so the bigger that grows, the state of the protocol execution grows, and that's what makes it hard for Proverif to verify messages that are larger than a certain amount, because the amount of scenarios to test on the network, the state space, explodes. So it grows exponentially with the number of elements in the state? Well, it depends on really, it depends on the protocol. It's not always like that. Uh, but it's definitely, uh, the difference between verifying two messages and three messages is big. The differences between three messages and four messages, for example, in signal, it really depends on the protocol. Because you might have a protocol that has a message that sends very little information, and so the growth. But in Signal, verif the difference between verifying a protocol where there are two messages and three messages is quite big, and between three messages and four messages is enormous, and then you just can't do it. So that's for Signal, and I suspect for most protocols, it's similar. Yes, I think it's better to have a microphone. It's okay. I okay. Now. Okay. Uh, he was saying about the uh, proper read. There was a query. Language that we use to create the to verify the authenticity. Yes. Is that some query language standard, or what is that? So the language used to describe all, everything in Proverif is called the applied calculus, and it is in fact a standard language. It's also used for cryptoverif, and here's the language. So you can see the queries at the top are also in that language. It's the same language used to ask queries to describe the functions of the protocol, to describe the top-level processes. Everything is in the same language, it's all in the same model file. And at the top here you have queries, like for example, at the very top of a query if the attacker has secret message one. And secret message one is essentially the first plain text that Alice is sending to Bob, right? And then later at the bottom you have, for example, the event. So here you have an event. Uh, Alice receives a message from Bob, and I want this event to be true if and only if um, um, Bob has sent a message to Alice. I think that's the one. And so you can see that this is the authenticity query. And you, you can actually see these models online. Um, you can, they're all on GitHub, and you can check them out yourself. And Just uh, go on my website and find the link. So well, my website is this website. Here, personal website. Yes. Uh, hey there, uh, I'm wondering, uh, when you're dealing with Proverif with this, uh, these levels, are you seeing if you're leaking some, uh, how much, if you're leaking some entropy, but not enough to leak the whole message, or do you be able to... That's, that's an excellent question. It is impossible to test for that in Proverif. Yeah. Because Proverif, uh, everything is symbolic, so in Proverif, when I want to define the number one, I'm defining this weird thing called one, and then the number two is this weird constant called two, and there's no mathematical relationship between the two. And I have to manually say that if you add one, two, one, you get this other constant called two. Because Proverif is unable to have any sort of probabilistic tooling machine relationships, any arithmetic relationships, any algebraic relationships. Um, so you cannot test, for example, if only parts of the message are leaked. You could model this, but it will be very artificial in Proverif and very useless. But if you do it in CryptoVerif, you can do it very well. And CryptoVerif is meant exactly to in CryptoVerif, you can model nonce reuse. And you can model nonce reuse quite easily in Proverif, but you can also model, for example, uh, the fact that SHA-1 is vulnerable to length extension attacks, uh, uh, certain weaknesses in uh, uh, partial, like partial weaknesses in the FGCM on nonce reuse, 
Uh, you can model uh, partial leaking of messages. This is all CryptoVerif stuff, and this is the number one reason why a lot of people prefer CryptoVerif. Okay, I have one more question uh, yeah. about uh, how uh, CryptoVerif is uh, written in F star, right? I no, CryptoVerif and ProVerif are written in OCaml. F star is very new. Okay, and okay. They both have existed for many, many years before F star. But the question I have is about F star anyway. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering how you're dealing with the, the type system and the faulting problem. So, how, so are you having uh, uh, a large system where you're where you actually, like, uh, uh, for instance, Kayan from here in, 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 in Gothenburg, you have some incon inconsistencies where you can actually prove false object, or are you having a smaller type system where not all types, or all true types are provable? I, I can't answer that. I don't know. Sorry. I, I have not worked at all at the F star language design. Uh, F star is frankly a pretty challenging language, and uh, only very recently I was able to implement Blake 2, the Blake 2 hash function in F star, and that was like my biggest achievement with F star. Um, and with F star, I'm more like working on uh, F star compilers that compile to F star or from F star, but the language itself is still very experimental. F star is very difficult, experimental, and buggy right now. You really have to work very hard to, but it can produce some results that are very interesting, nevertheless. Yeah? You mentioned before, uh, you, I can't remember which of the tool it was, but relating to side channel attacks. Elaborate on which, which kinds of side channels is basically the linkage. Uh, so, Hackle Star, yeah, Hackle Star, the cryptographic library, uh, is resistant to side channel attacks and it's resistant to, uh, for example, uh, so it's memory safe, uh, it erases from securely from memory in, in the C version. Um, it's also timing, it's resistant against timing attacks, and I suspect that's it, I think. Any other questions? I think I'm almost out of time. So I have five more minutes for questions, but probably we should give the other, uh, the next speaker time to start. If we don't have any more questions, I would like to thank Nadine for this great and interesting talk. Thank you so much.